All right, guys, welcome to Outside the Boards. In this episode, we're going to be talking with Patrick McCadden, who was one of my old coaches and also my business partner for um, Elite Performance Hockey. And he's currently a coach in the USHL, so he kind of get the inside scoop. I know I've been talking about the USHL a lot lately, and I, I just think it's really important to understand a lot about this league and its significance in hockey. First of all, introducing Patrick McCadden. Um, he's had a long playing career. He played juniors in the North American League. He played in the USHL. He played Division I, um, also played Division Three, and then he played in the pros. He played in the Southern Professional League and, and also in the East Coast Hockey League. And his coaching career has also been awesome. You're going in your sixth year yeah, and <laughs> coached five years at Lawrence University and NCAA Division Three school where that's where he coached me. And then this is his first year coaching in the USHL for the Green Bay Gamblers. So welcome, Patty. Dauber, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, happy to be here and uh, kind of shed some light on some good topics. Very excited to get some of your thoughts on, on the USHL. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you, um, as we look at this awesome picture of the Sioux Falls <laughs> Arena, um, it shows how big the USHL is. So what does the USHL mean to you and why are we even talking about this? Yeah, I mean, what what it means to me was, uh, you know, as a player was an incredible opportunity to to be in a league like this, right? It's, it's the only tier one league in the country, uh, meaning tier one junior A hockey. It is the best league in, in junior hockey in the United States. You know, there's there's people that may argue that it, it's close to, to major junior hockey in Canada, right? I mean, if you look at the number of players drafted uh, in the NHL draft every year, it's a significant amount from the league directly. So if you look at the rosters as well in terms of college commitments, and almost every player by Christmas is committed. And I look at our team right now, and we really have three players that are uncommitted, and that's that's on our training camp roster out of, out of 30 players, right? It, it's very high-level hockey if you can – play in the league you're almost guaranteed to to play division one hockey you know it, it's a great league and uh, a great place to develop your game that's awesome ah. I think that's absolutely incredible <laughs> I mean seriously three players that are uncommitted is I mean is that the norm at this you know point? it really is yeah I mean there's there was a handful of players that that attended our even our tryout camp you know if I, I don't know the number off the top of my head but probably I would say over 10 probably 10 to 20 that that were committed to schools that didn't end up making our roster. It is kind of the norm nowadays. I would say that's changed a little bit since when I was in the league 12 years ago as a player. Back then, it was more you went to the USHL to get your scholarship. Nowadays, most of the players coming in already have their scholarship, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I mean, that that's more just how the Division One schools are doing their recruiting these days. But yeah, it's crazy. I, I talked to a school uh, actually earlier today, and uh, he was asking me about our players. And I <laughs> I didn't have a whole lot to talk to him about. Uh, just <laughs> he had such a, a small number of uncommitted guys, but um, but yeah, again, it speaks volumes to, to how good the league is. In U.S. hockey, they kind of picture this like these are the players that are going to represent the United States in the NHL someday. Do you kind of feel that, or yeah, I would say that's you know kind of the goal of the league. It's it's the top league for American-born players. I mean, there's actually a rule in the league. You can only have six import players. All other players on your roster have to be American. So USA Hockey is the governing body, and that kind of helps with growing hockey in the U.S. specifically, where, you know, we, we're not having uh, rosters full of, you know, uh, Canadians or Europeans, right? It's it's mostly American players in the league, which that that's kind of the goal. And, and it's yes, it's definitely a developmental league. For college number one and and like you said uh for pro hockey and, and even the nhl as well we're going to kind of transition and start talking about the details of the league and kind of the behind the scenes of what you deal with as a coach and as a staff discussing strategies when tendering and drafting and dealing with all that stuff building your roster because we know that you know in my last video i talked about how it's a 25 man roster during the season correct so you gotta correct. you know yep. it's a lot of players and you gotta dwindle it down quick and like you said half over half of these guys are already committed and it's it's a tough tough thing for you guys to deal with how often do ushl teams use their tenders and how does how does it affect your decision when the ruling is that these players that are tendered, they have to play in games, correct? It's not like the North American League. Right. Yeah. No, really good question. You know, as far as the tenders, each team only has two per year. 
and they're only to be used on uh, 15 and, and players turning 16 in that year, right? So for this year, we have two tenders that we can use on 2007 birth years. As far as how often uh, teams use them, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I want to say there was maybe seven to eight tenders total used last year, right? Wow. So it's a really small number. The reason for that is basically because you're asking a 16-year-old to step into the league and play a certain number of games right away. Um, it's about yeah. 60% of the games is, is what they have to play. That's the ruling, right? So teams have different philosophies. Some teams, they, you know, you get a, a high-end player that, that they believe can do that. They'll use their tender. And then they have the, you know, that's when the, the recruiting side of it comes into play. You know, they, they then have that player on their roster the next season. Um, other teams might not want to do that. And, you know, the one thing I'd tell you, they, the, you forego your first round pick when you use your first tender in the, our phase one draft, which is for that 2007 birth year this spring. Um, mm -hmm. If you use two, now you forego your second round pick, right? So yeah, it's kind of a, I know that's a kind of a long answer, but, you know, I would tell most players that from a tender standpoint, they don't happen often in the USHL. Uh, the players that are tendered are very high end players, um, typically uh, players that have options at the major junior level in Canada, you know, potential options at the national team development program, um, or were just, you know, kind of right on that bubble. Maybe they didn't make the, the NTDP, but they can play in the league, right? So yeah. the, the, the honest answer is it's few and far between in terms of players that, that will ever really be offered a tender in our league. This is, you know, that's just, this is your version of protecting one of the best players in the country at their certain age right. level, basically. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, exactly. You know, these, these are kids that, that you expect to come in and, and contribute right away. Otherwise you're, you wouldn't use your tender on. Yeah. Right. And we're talking about tenders. Where are these players coming from then? Where, where, you know, you're talking about elite players and, you know, obviously we, those tenders are for those top, say top 1% or whatever in the country at their age level. Well, what about the rest of the league? You know, there's 16 teams. Where do these kids come from? You, you got it on your slide here. Uh, AAA is is heavily scouted um, across the country. You know, any <laughs> all over the country, there's going to be USHL scouts at, at, you know, U15 AAA games, U16 mm -hmm. and, and U18 as well. Um, it, it looks like you got Hill Murray uh, in <laughs> high school. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, you know, definitely scouted heavily. High school hockey is. Kind of depending on the region, you know, obviously uh, high school hockey is a lot stronger in different areas of the country, right? Uh, talking Hill Murray, uh, you know, Minnesota is one of the top states from a high school hockey standpoint. Some other states might not have as high level high school hockey. Scouts in those areas would probably watch more AAA. But then a lot of other junior leagues, you know, there's, we have two drafts, right? We have a phase one draft, which is 16 year old players. And then the phase two is open to any player that's junior eligible from an age standpoint. So when you're looking at the phase one, it's almost primarily U15 uh, AAA or, or high school. When you're talking the phase two draft, that's when you see a lot more junior players, right, that, that have played in other junior leagues. The North American League is a big one, right? If a, a player can go to the North American League and be successful and still has junior eligibility, you'll see a lot of the, those types of players get drafted in the, the phase two portion, right? And also older AAA players, you'll see some U18 AAA players that, you know, mm. maybe they didn't get, get picked in the phase one draft. You, you move along and then it, maybe they develop a little bit later and they're really good players. And then all yeah. of a sudden, you know, they're taken in the phase two draft, so. Well, one one more question about this. Then the one one thing you didn't mention is tier three. How does that fall in? Is tier three is that a possibility or? In all reality, I would say you probably need to. It it, it it's not that it's impossible, but you're probably not going to see somebody go directly from tier three to the USHL. Most likely, a player would have to go tier three up to the North American League. And then, and then to the USHL. Yeah, I, I know a player specifically off the top of my head. I, I, I recruited a couple of uh, your former teammates off his team in the, the St. Louis Junior Blues. Uh, that specific player, he played for the Junior Blues, not um, a Tier 3 team, and the, the North American uh, 3HL. And then he went up to Janesville in the North American League. Mm -hmm. And then he went up to Madison in the USHL and I believe gotcha. that yeah. makes sense though. I mean, that's what those leagues are for and just development and the town. It just gets better and better. 
Absolutely. Right. right. No, it's that you nailed that it. it's all about development. And, you know, uh, what I would tell players is hockey's a long-term development sport, right? Just because somebody's the best player at age 16 doesn't mean they're going to be at 18 or 20. Right. So right. you want to just keep working and, you know, it, it's a long-term process for sure. When players are drafted or the draft is occurring, do these players know that they're going to be drafted or is it just like, Oh, wow. I just got drafted in the USHL. Um, for the most part, they, they're probably going to have an idea. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do a lot of interviews with players that we're going to potentially draft, you know, whether we talk to the player directly, uh, whether we talk to their advisor, you know, most players have an idea, right. It's, it's pretty mm-hmm. rare that you, you, you wouldn't hear anything from a team or any team and then all of a sudden you're, you get drafted but i'm sure that's happened right um yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of players taken so uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that you won't get drafted but more than likely you would hear from a team as teams kind of want to get to know the individual and for us if if we're going to use a draft pick on a player we want to have at least a good idea that they're they're going to report to camp right so yeah right so so you said you guys do some interviews yeah, we, you know, a lot of teams will talk to players, get to know them, get to know mm-hmm. their their personality, their families, what they want to, you know, do long term in, in the sport and, you know, just get a feel for the the human part of it. Right. And and mm-hmm. see if they're going to fit in with your organization, uh, with your group, kind of what your vision is. Right. So. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it can it gets pretty detailed, that process. All teams have. Full, full scouting staff, uh, directors of scouting, general managers, assistant general managers. So there's a lot of a lot of people in each organization out on the road uh, doing that groundwork. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. I I always tell players, you know, it's so important to to treat people with respect and do this and and just be good teammates. But it's it's interesting to hear it from somebody else because somebody that's actually doing the recruiting, not just their current coach, that's telling them that. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's that's real. You know, uh, <laughs> if a player's going to be a headache and we know it, it's they better be really good because for us to put up with that is, yeah, they, right, they, right, they gotta, absolutely, they got to put produce right. So uh, yeah, we definitely do our homework on the not not only the player we we can watch that, but the the person as well. We talked about the draft, and we're going to continue to hammer you with these questions about the draft. But what is the actual significance? So say you're somebody that's drafted. Mm-hmm. and and you go to training camp you know what does that mean or is that on your on the team are you still trying out or are you yeah basically getting drafted just means that that whoever drafts you has your rights for uh the time being and that's basically we have until july 10th what it was this year to either put you on our 30-man roster or our affiliate list once that's submitted if you're on it then you're either come into our training camp or we have your rights mm-hmm. moving forward. But uh, every player has to come to the the team's tryout camp and they have to show their skills in front of the coaching staff and the scouting staff and, and earn the right to be on those lists, right? So if you get drafted in May and if you come to camp and you don't have a good camp, or, you know, it just, it doesn't work out, then, then that's that, right? So, you know, as, as far as the significance, it's a good thing, obviously, but it's by no means a guarantee, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we parted ways with players we drafted in this spring, and that's just the nature of the beast that's going to happen every year, just due to the number of players that you do draft and the number of spots that you can have on your roster and your affiliate list. So now that being said, it's uh, definitely good recognition for you either way. Um, I can guarantee you that, that probably every single Division One college is watching that draft and seeing mm. the names and, and putting them, those players on their list. And it, it's a good thing for sure. And in other junior leagues, right, you know, you, you look at the North American League, another really good league um, that produces a lot of good uh, college and pro players. Those those teams are watching our draft and, and yeah. watching who, what team what teams take what players, right? So it's definitely a good thing to get drafted, but by no means a guarantee to, to play on the team. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And that, I think that's kind of what I've, I've met. A few players either have been drafted or people they know have been drafted, and they're like, oh, my God, they're drafting the USHL. And I think you and I sit here and you're like, okay, you know, let's see how it plays out. And then you're right. It is, okay, you can obviously play, but – you have to prove yourself at that level. It's it's very, like you said, it's just so competitive. So yeah, 
No, a hundred percent. And you know, we, we draft 10, uh, 16 year olds each year and, and mm-hmm. they have, they have three years to be on our affiliate list if they want. Right. So yeah. um, we got young players on the list. We got some older players on the list and everybody's put together and they're all competing for 25 spots at the end of the day. So it's a step, but a lot more to be done after just like the NHL. Right. So somebody that's not drafted or tendered, um, say they're not even on the USHL radar. Somebody saw them and gave them an invite to a USHL camp. Should they attend the camp? You know, I would, I would say yes. Um, you know, I can kind of give you my history as a player and, and tryout camps. You know, I went to a team that's no longer in existence, but uh, they were in the USHL back when I was a player called the Indiana Ice. I went to their, their main camp two summers in a row. I got cut two summers in a row. Um, so, you know, obviously from a mental standpoint, that was, was not the most fun experience, but in the, the, the following summer, I was uh, invited to go to Green Bay's camp. I went there. I had those past experiences in Indiana. I knew what to expect. I knew what the, the trial process was all about. I wasn't nearly as nervous as I was going to those other camps because I had that experience. And mm-hmm. uh, fortunately for me, it worked out. I had a, a good camp, able to show myself well to the coach and staff and uh, was fortunate to be invited back to training camp and ultimately make the roster. So you know, I would tell players that, yes, um, if you can make it work, you know, just go have fun, work as hard as you can, do your best. Don't be nervous. Yeah. Or, or you have a really good chance to make the team. Maybe not. Right. But that doesn't mean you're not going to exp- uh, get a really good experience going to it to help you out in your, your next season, whether you're going back to midget hockey or high school hockey or lower, lower level junior hockey. And then, and then on top of that, there's guys that get division one scholarships right out of our camp. I mean, we probably had 25 to 30, wow. 40, or even 40 division one schools uh, over the, the five days we had camp uh, mm-hmm. watching, watching those players. Right. So it's exposure as well. And, and, you know, that's not just to colleges, that's to other junior teams as well. North American league, right. teams, you'll see a ton of them at USHL camps doing their own scouting and recruiting. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, that makes total sense to me. I also did, you know, I did, I didn't do USHL camps, but I did North American league camps. And I just, I agree. I think my only regret is that I didn't do it when I was 17 and I did it when I was 18 because I went in and I was like already 18 years old and was blindsided by junior hockey. Right. Because it's so competitive. And then I, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for when I was 18, which is the biggest, one of the biggest years for you. So. No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. If you can get, get that experience and get it at a young age, uh, the better off you're going to be right. You know, yeah. you might not be ready for junior hockey, but it, it at least help you out when you are. We've talked about the draft. We talked about the tenders and kind of the situations that these players go through. And we've kind of talked about the good side of it of, you know, you have the opportunity to, to go play. At the same time, you've also mentioned that nothing's really guaranteed, I guess, except for tenders. But you also said that tenders don't happen very often. So what, what is your piece of advice for a player that's drafted or tendered in the USHL? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, from a drafted player standpoint, con- one, congratulations. It's exciting. You know, it, it definitely shows that, um, you know, you're you're a good player and that people are noticing, right? And, and, you know, kudos to you for that. That's awesome and definitely something to be celebrated and it is a milestone, but um, at the same time, definitely not something to rest on, right? We, mm-hmm. every year, uh, just based from a number standpoint, you, you're going to re- – not take players that you draft that's just how the numbers game works and there's no guarantee right and it doesn't matter how high you're drafted um you got to make sure that you know you you yes the team's interested in you but you still have to go to their camp and you got to show yourself against returning players against other draft picks and it's it's a very competitive and you better be ready to go right and you know if you you sit around and you you celebrate too much then other players uh are gonna pass you by right you know get to work because uh it's tough as a 16 year old in the league right uh for for someone that that is tendered in the league it's hey those type of players have a real shot to already be on nhl radars and um a real wow. shot to to get to that level. So the work's only beginning for for both drafted and tendered players alike, right? So and and then I can guarantee there's a lot of undrafted players that are are going to put that work in. So it's definitely not something to rest on. You know that brings us to the next question. Then 
Um, say you're somebody that is not on any USHL radar, not invited to a tryout, never talked to a scout, but you want to play juniors and you want to try to pursue a college hockey career. Yeah, my advice is that you try to attend another junior league camp, right? Um, you know, whether that's the North American League, whether it's the NA3, whether it's a USPHL team, right? There's a there's a lot of options now, uh, more so than when I was a player for players that do want to play junior hockey, which is great. I mentioned it earlier in the in the interview. There's, um, you know, it, it's a long term development process, and you might not be in on the USHL's radar, but uh, that doesn't mean you can't be two years down the road. And mm -hmm. a lot of good players, a lot of good college hockey players, a lot of good NHL players that didn't play in the USHL. It, it's yeah. it's not the end all be all if you can't can't play in in the USHL. But you know, yeah, my biggest advice would be continue to chase your dream and and just keep working yeah I, well, that's that's a great way to put it a lot of those players you know not not every division one player can come from this league because there's only 16 teams so they're coming from other places and you know you got to put your head down and, and put in the work i think that's that's awesome and i hope a lot of people listening to this takes that take that to heart because i think some sometimes players get too wrapped up in that concept of where you play and where you don't play and and that kind of thing um, no, a hundred percent. You know, there's uh, I think you hit the nail on the head with hey, there's 16 USHL teams. And I think it's, I don't even know the exact number. Now they seem to keep adding to yeah. 65, maybe more division one teams. And, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of different leagues that the division one teams recruit, not just, just the USHL. So great league to be in, but a lot of other good spots as well. And don't worry too much about the label. That's what I would tell. Mm -hmm. So this brings us to the last question that I feel like, you know, this is um, when we do our camps, you know, this is a lot of big question that we get is, you know, what, what are these people looking for? What is, what is somebody like you, USHL scout, and I know college, maybe you're looking for a little different things, but hockey wise, probably not pretty similar. What are you looking for when you scout and recruit players at a high level? Oh, that's a great question. You know, there's, there's a couple different things that I look at specifically that, you know, it's to me, it starts with the foundation, which is skating, right? Uh, that's you go back to our camps that, that we run together and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of our philosophy and um, that's why we do it so much. Right. And you look at the best skaters in the world, they're the players that make it to the national hockey league. Right. And the reason they, they do is because they can skate, they can keep up every, the higher you go, every level, it gets faster and faster. And the only way you're going to be able to keep up is if you can skate. Right. So um, when I'm watching players, that's the first thing you notice pretty quickly. You can tell, okay, can they skate? Can they not? Now is that, always the deciding factor on if you want a player or not. No, there's definitely players that can use a lot of work on their skating, but they, they have some of the other intangibles, right? You talk about hockey IQ and uh, how does a player think the game, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that's a big one that, that we watch for specifically. And, you know, a, a big one for me personally is competitiveness. How hard does the play, a, a player compete? Right. Because when you get to the a league like the USHL, the margin for error is very small. And the difference between winning and losing hockey games is can come down to who wants it more um, on a nightly basis. Right. So mm. and then obviously, you know, that with with same same deal at college. Right. So to me, how how bad does a player want it? You know, as a player look like they're out for a a fun Sunday skate and joking around and laughing, or is that player engaged and ready to go from the, the second the puck drops until the end of the game? That's a big one for me personally. I think that's a, that's a big one to preach. And then sometimes it feels like when you're coaching players, I mean, even when you're coaching in college or not, I mean, now that you guys have your roster about set or, you know, you know, a good chunk of your players, it's a hard one to, uh, to communicate that, you know, that you're just not putting the, this this is there's a lack of visual compete and mm -hmm. i think it's hard sometimes for players to understand that let me let me ask you a little bit or a little different question that's more specific how much does production matter in terms of getting scouted and recruiting like are you lo only looking at these top teams and are you only looking at their top goal scorers and producers or like no, it's a, that's a great question. The direct answer would be no. I mean, it, 
if if I had to kind of tell you how I would do it from the college side. But from a college standpoint, I would look at statistics. Obviously, you want to know, okay, who's the leading scorer, uh, things of that nature. But again, it's it's not the end all be all. The the top scorer on the team might not be the best fit for our team, right? Yeah. Um. There, you, you go back to those intangibles of you know hockey IQ, compete level skating ability um you know shooting stick handling passing all that right um which isn't necessarily determined on points you know i mean there could yeah. be a a player who's really good on the power play at, at the midget triple a level and has 75 points um and another player uh in the same league who maybe doesn't play a ton on the power play or isn't as effective on the power play that is a really good 200 foot player who wins faceoffs is good defensively plays with good detail to his game stops on pucks doesn't turn away finishes his hits versus that power play p- player who you know turns away from pucks has horrible habits doesn't back check mm-hmm. um we're taking that 200 foot player a hundred out of a hundred times. Right. Yeah. So, um, no, we, we definitely pay attention to it for sure. You know, obviously offense is great and goal scores don't grow on trees, but you know, the, the small details is where you really have to focus as a scout that it's going to determine, um, you know, can a player adjust and be productive at the next level. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's a big one that we focus on. So my advice to players listening to this is, Hey, the, the little habits that your coach preaches that that might sound annoying and you might get tired of hearing, um, you, you should listen to them because I can promise you that's what we're watching. That's that's awesome. I really, I love that answer. And I think that that hits it all right there. Well, thank you, Patty. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate it so much. Um, seriously, I know you guys are, you got your camp going on right now and you're trying to do your thing and you're, you're waking up early and grinding these guys on two a days <laughs> currently. So <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's fun, fun stuff right now. So, um, but no, appreciate you having me. Definitely hope this helps anyone listening and, uh, I'll take it to heart and just keep working hard and having fun with the game. That's that's the most important piece. Just have fun playing hockey because that's that's what what it's all about. Thank you, Patty. Thanks again. Um, appreciate it and take care. Absolutely, good stuff, Dobber. See ya. Thank you for watching Outside the Boards with me, Jacob at North End Hockey. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to our YouTube page or follow us on Instagram to see more videos like this one. If interested in learning more about North End Hockey, check out our website, northendhockey.com. Thanks for watching.